Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, giving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Amen? Let us pray. Father, I praise you for this church. Uh, Father, VBS yesterday, just watching so many kids with so much joy. Uh, Father, I praise you for, for pouring the Holy, the Holy Spirit into this church. Um, and that's the thing, one of, one, of the, uh, one of the gifts that you provide us is joy. Um, it's a fruit of the Spirit. And Father, every, every Sunday, I, I feel it in here. And again, Father, I, just, I can't praise you enough for that. Father, I've, I've been in some of your homes in some of these churches that I didn't feel it. And um, I just praise you for letting us know that your presence is here. I praise you for that. Father, today you have given me a message that's a tough topic. Um, but Father, I have no doubt you've prepared me to give your word today. Um, Father, in this moment, I ask that you anoint me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, that you take all distractions, Father, anything that's trying to creep into my mind away. God, today I'm asking that you give me in place of that your boldness. I need that. I need your boldness to deliver this message. And Father, also, most importantly, give me your love. Father, one thing you continue to show me is that when people leave this church each and every Sunday, if they feel your love, we've done our job. So God, I just ask that you pour that on these people whether it be through me, the worship team, or this congregation itself. I ask that everybody walks out of here today, Father, feeling your love. I ask these things in your name. Help us to love, laugh, and forgive. Amen. I'm just going to get straight to it. Today we are preaching, and, or excuse me, we're discussing a very sensitive and tough subject. And uh, Go ahead and throw that title up there for me, Nick. It's abuse. I'm going to tell you all how I got here. Last week, after preaching uh, biblical divorce, talking about divorce and, and the four legal reasons to exit that divorce, uh, if those things come up, after preaching that, literally right after preaching it, the text messages, the emails, the social media messages just started pouring in. And I'd say 80% of it was about abuse. And I had no idea what I was supposed to preach on today, and this is how God likes to work with me, is, is he gives it to me this way. I had no doubt that this was something that he was wanting us to preach on today, just through, again, the reaction that we received from last week. But another thing that I really figured out by reading some of these emails, guys, churches are not talking about this. And I don't understand that. And, and not only that, but the ones that actually are, some of them, some of them that are teaching on it, are teaching it wrong. To hear that churches are saying no matter how abusive a spouse may be, whether to you or your children, that you cannot exit that covenant is completely false. And I feel like I touched on this subject just for a minute last week, and again, this needs to be expanded. A lot of churches run from talking about tough situations. And I get that. Because it's hard to preach. It can, it can move in a lot of different directions. But here's the thing, guys. Don't, don't you understand that usually the right thing is the hard thing? I need everybody in this room to understand this church will not run from the tough topics. We're going to talk about them. Better to talk about it here than outside of here. You talk about it outside of here, you're not going to get the truth. Today, we're going to get a lot of truth, but we're also going to get some grace. I want to start this sermon by going on the record with what your church, your church leadership, and your pastor thinks about abuse. It is completely unacceptable. This church, I assure you, will never turn a blind eye to abuse. 
It's not going to happen. We take it very serious, as all churches should. I want to look at the definition of abuse. Abuse is a pattern of behavior that uses fear or force to maintain power or control. That's abuse. This church, again, we hate abuse. But more importantly, you need to understand that God absolutely hates abuse. I want to look at Genesis 6.13. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out along with the earth. As a kid growing up, I was taught the story of Noah's Ark, and it was cute. You know, you had your little boat, you know, you would draw pictures, you had two giraffes, you, you know, you had you have two tigers, two lions. I don't know why he decided to bring two mosquitoes. I still ain't figured that one out yet. But the story was always cute growing up. Guys, the reason that God was fixing to wipe out mankind was because of abuse. There's a lot of verses about that in that story. We don't have time to go over all that today, so I highly recommend you go read it. But guys, that's how serious God took abuse and violence. The whole earth was going that direction. And God was fixing to wipe it out. And he, he wiped it out except for Noah and his family. So we know immediately that God takes abuse and violence very serious, just off of the story of Noah and Noah's Ark. If you think this only applies to the Old Testament, then I want to go and look and see what Jesus says about it in Matthew 18, 6. This one's stout. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Jesus is telling you that tying a cinder block around your neck and throwing you off a bridge, that the outcome of that is better than the outcome you'll have by abusing one of his children. This isn't red, guys. So we know God takes it serious because of Noah's Ark. I think we can figure out Jesus takes it serious. Amen? Can we agree on that? I need some Christian head nods. I'm not saying very many. Thank you. This is a stout verse, but even this verse is not the strongest verse that talks about abuse in the Bible. I want to go to Psalms 11.5. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. You know, I think about, you know, I'm a big Dallas Cowboy fan. That's right. That's right. Amen. <laughs> so, so, listen, I ain't going to lie to y'all. I, 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 I hate the Redskins. I hate the Giants. And I really hate the Philadelphia Eagles. Okay? <laughs> but I don't hate them with a passion. That's a whole different level of hate. And we're talking about our Father in Heaven. With a passion. There's nobody else more passionate than God. And He hates it with a passion. Christian warriors, I need you to catch something. If God hates abuse, you can hate abuse too. You do not have to tolerate it. You do not have to stay in an abusive relationship. Do y'all hear me? You don't have to stay in that relationship. And I'm telling you right now as your pastor, if you're in a relationship that's abusive, I want to know. Because we'll do something about it. We will not turn a blind eye to it. We'll do everything we can to correct it. But I need you to understand we're fixing to talk about this. I'm fixing to show you how we're going to correct it, okay? 
Don't think that the church, your church, doesn't take this very serious. We hate abuse with a passion. So now that we know what God thinks about abuse, I want to talk about the three parties that are involved in abusive situations. The first party I want to talk about is the abused, the ones that have been abused. To those of you that may be sitting in this room that have been abused, I need you to know that God has a special place in his heart for you. I want to go look at Luke 4.18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. If you've been abused, you're, you're the oppressed. And Jesus, our Savior, is telling us that you will be set free. For those of you that have been abused, God understands exactly how you feel because he was also abused. When you think about the story of Christianity, does it ever cross your mind that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was abused? There were people who used fear and force to maintain power or control over him or tried to. You know, when you, when you, it's kind of like Noah's Ark, you know, when you're growing up and you hear the story of Jesus dying on the cross, we don't think about what that man had to go through, what our father had to go through. Guys, I want you to think about it. If you've been abused, God understands. Because God in the flesh was spit on, cussed at, slapped, mocked, had a thorns shoved on his head, nails through his hands, and he was innocent. What I need to get the point across to people today, if you're sitting in this room or you're watching online and you've been abused, so is our Father. And I need you to understand, if you look at what happened after the abuse of our Father, he rose from the dead, and only good came after him. The same opportunity goes for you. The same opportunity. God feels you pain if you've been abused, guys. He understands it. Now I want to move on to the second party involved in an abusive situation, and that is the abusive, the one's the abuser. Before I move on to the abusive, I want you to look at something else first, church. I want you to take a moment, and I want you to look at you, each one of you. I'm going to ask you all some questions. Do you seem to have a pattern of behavior where you end up furious or angry? Do you lose control when you get angry? When you're angry, do you express your anger with insults, name-calling, or physical acts? Have you ever punched a wall or thrown something? Have you ever grabbed someone's wrist so they could not leave the room? Have you ever lashed out in a physical way to where people cower in your presence? When you're angry, do people walk on eggshells around you? Do people change their plans just to appease you? Do you get jealous when your spouse is with their friends? Have you ever threatened to hurt yourself if someone called the cops or left you? Do you use biblical strip scripture like honor your parents, submit to your husband, or forgive your enemies to get what you want? Have you ever tried to convince your children or your spouse that to love and forgive means that they cannot tell anyone what's going on in your home? 
If you answered yes to any of these questions, then you yourself have been abusive. I want to go back to Psalms 11.5. Nick? The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. I hate to stand on this stage and tell you that prior to 10 years ago, before God changed my life, I had to say yes to some of those questions. I had to. I had a terrible temper. Terrible temper. I, I, you know, I'd fight at the drop of a hat. I would be aggressive and boisterous. I feel like people had to walk on eggshells around me. I'll never forget one time, <laughs> me and Amanda, we were engaged, and uh, I was at her apartment in Dallas. We were watching TV, and we got in an argument about something. What's sad is, is what I did after that, and I don't even remember what we got in a fight about, you know, like it was that important. We were watching TV, and I grabbed the TV remote because I didn't like what she had to say to me. And you know, I was tough. And I threw the TV remote into the wall. And it literally broke in 30 pieces. Ladies, I want you to follow what my wife did. We are engaged, keep this in mind. And she looked at me and she said, no children of mine will see that. You better change. A godly woman changed my life. I realized real quick, she's serious. And I knew I couldn't do any better. <laughs> Ladies, this is what I need you to grasp. If your husband's abusive, you do not have to be submissive to him. We talked about this last week. We've talked about it many times. That's outside of that marriage covenant that God has you in. Abuse is not in there. Ladies, that is your moment to step up and be the spiritual leader of the household. You were put on this earth. Some of you ladies, I know y'all don't like this, but listen, don't be mad at me. You can be mad at the creator, okay? In Genesis, it tells us that man was stupid and we needed a helper, okay? And he sent y'all. Thank God. When we're down, when we're not doing right, when we're not leading right, we need our helper. And 11 years ago, my wife set me straight. If these questions describe the pattern of your life today, your number one fear shouldn't be the cops or losing a loved one question you should be asking yourself is where am I going when I die I'm serious he hates it with a passion we had a list last week of the things that he hates he hates this with a passion if this is you I need you to understand that what you are doing God hates again I mean with a passion that's what it, he hates it you need to repent immediately and you need to have a heart change if you do this if you truly repent and change God will use you now, I know what you're thinking like Michael there's no way God's gonna use some abuser to build his kingdom I have biblical evidence to back this up let's go look at Matthew 10 2 through 4 those are the names or excuse me these are the names of the 12 apostles first Simon who is called Peter and his brother Andrew James and his brother John Philip and Bartholomew Thomas and Matthew the tax collector James and Thaddeus Simon the zealot and Judas who betrayed him Simon the zealot a zealot back in that time 
did not like how the government was running things. So what they would do is they would hide and sneak around, put daggers in their suits and so forth, and they would sneak up in, in large crowds to the leaders of the government and they'd kill them. They were terrorists. That's what they were. But what's so cool about that is, is Jesus looked at Simon the Zealot and he said, follow me. Here's the difference. He followed him. He changed his life. He had a heart change. He repented for the things that he did and he followed Jesus. If that's not enough evidence for you, I want to go look at a guy that wrote half of the New Testament. Let's go look and see what Paul said about his own self before he became saved in 1 Timothy 1, 13 through 14. Even though I used to blasphemy the name of Christ, in my insolence I persecuted his people. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Jesus Christ. Paul persecuted and murdered Christians. Simon and Paul were very abusive and violent men. But God used them because they had a heart change. They had a heart change. They followed him. Abusers, your past doesn't matter. If you repent and have a heart change like Simon and Paul, God will use you. Now, you need to pay for the consequences of your past. We're not going to ignore that. You need to get help. You need to be counseled. But I assure you, again, if you're willing to own up to your sins, God will use you. Guys, I've got stories right here in this, in this church. I've got stories in the last 10 years of Christian warrior ministry where abuse has happened. I've got to counsel some of these people, and I've watched it change the entire household once they change their heart. We've got local stories of this. Because I know a lot of times all we hear is the bad side of it. And I'll tell you why. Well, I'm, I'm going to get into that. Hang on. I'm getting way ahead of myself. Okay, let's move along. This leads me into the third party that is involved in an abusive situation, and that is the church. I realize some churches are not involved when abuse takes place, but dead gummit, they should be. I assure you, if given the chance, this church will be. But notice I said, if given the chance. Too many times abuse goes on without anyone knowing. You got to bring it to somebody's attention. You have to. If given the chance, how should the church get involved? There's one Bible verse that explains it all. We're going to look at Isaiah 117. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Defend the oppressed. The word oppressed has a few different definitions, but one of them is abuse. So right here, God is telling his church to help the abused. What does this look like? How do we help the abuse? There's two ways. The first is truth. That's the first. You got to give them the truth. You can't sugarcoat things in an abusive situation, okay? We had a dear friend years ago who was dating a guy that I knew immediately was not good. I knew he wasn't. I, I just tell him, I can sense this stuff out, okay? If you plan on dating my daughter, I'm telling you right now, I sense it out, okay? I knew this guy was not good for her. And it got to the point, y'all know what I'm talking about. You, you, some of y'all been in this, y'all have heard this situation. Maybe you've been in this situation, you've had a friend in this situation, but then all of a sudden we're not seeing her anymore. And we used to see her all the time. So immediately I'm like, he's jealous. 
Then it got to a point we weren't seeing her at all, and I'm thinking, she don't want to show the bruises. We continued to tell her, this guy ain't right. You got to get away. You got to get away. She kept going back. She'd leave a couple days, she'd come back. She'd leave, she'd come back. You may think people are stupid by staying in those relationships. But this, this girl told me this. By the way, just to let you know, she ended up leaving the guy. She's married now, and she's extremely happy, and she has a great man in her life. And amen, God got a hold of that situation, okay? Amen, amen. But I'll never forget what she told me. When, you know, because I know people thought she was stupid. But this is what she said. When you've been surrounded by lies, you think the truth is crazy. They're blinded from the truth. So don't give up on giving truth to the abused, guys. Share these things we're talking about today. Keep loving them. Keep loving on them. And that comes to the second thing that we have to do. We've got to give them grace. We've got to keep loving them. Don't give up on them. You know, another thing is when they finally realize the truth, when they finally figure out the truth, don't go to them and say, I told you so. Don't do that. At that point, they don't need that. They need somebody to lean on. When this individual finally realized that she had had enough and everything was wrong, she came to us, and we just loved on her. We're just there for her. We're that shoulder to cry on and lean on and protect her, by the way. When she finally got to the point where she realized that now we've become protectors. We're going to protect her. She wouldn't let us at the beginning. Now she would. Be that person that the abused can lean on. Always be there for them. That's how we show grace. But the abused is not all the church is called to help Christian warriors. You better understand we are also called to help the abusive as well. Defend the oppressed. Y'all notice that little A up there? Okay. That means this sentence has a different or multiple meaning, so forth. In, in Hebrew, if you, if you find that in your Bible, if you look down at the bottom of the page, it'll explain it to you, it'll show it to you. Okay. So I did that. I went and looked what this was, and it says this sentence also means to correct the oppressor. So not only are we called to take care of the people that got abused, we're called to help the people that did the abusing. So how's that look? How's the church help the abusive? The same way we're called to help the abused, with grace and truth. And I'm not going to lie, giving truth to someone, or excuse me, giving, even helping somebody that, that, that's abusive, I, 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 it's hard. It's very hard. I'm not going to lie to you. But I will say this. If you allow, okay, here's what I'll tell you. Okay, our flesh, all right, if I found out that somebody was abusing somebody in this church, my first reaction is not good. I'm mad because my first reaction is with my flesh, okay? Now, we have every right to be upset about it. God hates it, right? He hates it with a passion. He hates it with a passion. But here's the thing, guys. We can either cancel that person out that was the abuser, and just let them go and not try to change their walk, they're going to go do it again. They're going to go do it again. So instead of acting out of the flesh, that's when I literally have to drop to my knees, God, you got to take over here. I'm mad. Like, as soon as I see this dude, I'm going to punch him in the mouth. Like, I just, I have no respect for anybody that will put hands on a woman. Zero. A woman or a child, I've got zero respect. None. I get fighting mad. I hate it with a passion. So I have to drop to my knees, God take over, and he always does. Like when I finally sit face to face with the person that was abusing, I don't have that anger anymore. 
because I became submissive to God. Now, if they don't take the truth that I'm giving them, Do y'all all think that pastors are perfect? No. Amen. <laughs> I told Annabelle this just a couple days ago. We were sitting there talking, and uh, we were talking about, you know, one day when she gets married, a long time from now, 20 years. <laughs> got to be at least 35 before you get married. Sadie, you got to be 40. <laughs> Caroline, I don't have to worry about her. I don't think any man's crazy enough to mess with Caroline. Just being honest with you. <laughs> Poor Caroline, she's so sweet. I know, right? She's the sweetest thing, man. I love that girl. Love her. Um, I was telling Annabelle, you know, she said, Dad, what are you going to do if, if I marry this guy and, and, you know, he's mean or, you know, we get in arguments and all this? And, and I told her, I said, sweetheart, here's what I need you to understand. The day that I give you away, I'm no longer your protector. That, that's your guy. I'm no longer the man of your life. Now, I'll always be the first man that loved you. And nobody will ever love you like I love you. Amen. Amen? Amen? But when I hand your hand to him, he has now become the number one man in your life. And I pray every day that the three men that marry my three daughters are godly men, and they will be. <laughs> but I did tell her this. Baby, don't come to me if he tells you you can't have money. Don't come to me if he talks bad about your cooking. Don't come to me if he tells you that y'all can't go out of town one weekend or something like that. But if he abuses you, you let me know immediately. Because that's when I'll put my foot down. Because I hate it with a passion. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. You're sitting here looking at me like, well, you just told us you're going to let God take over and so forth. There's a difference between a pastor and a father. And I'm telling you right now, men, if you're abusing in your home and you got daughters, they're going to marry a man like you. So the way that you can correct the situation is love them with a passion. Love your wife with a passion. And pray every day that God puts a godly man in your daughter's life. Amen. I hope it doesn't come to that, but I will hurt some dude. <laughs> that pastor man is gone. You know what I'm saying? So how to do what? Preach yeah, preach in prison. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know it's funny you say that. Okay. Wear that yeah, I wear an orange shirt. Yeah, you know orange is not my color. I promise. That's it's not my color. <laughs> oh, it used to be Mikey P's, though. Where's Mikey at? Mikey ain't back here. <laughs> this is what I love about this church. Listen, I ain't going to lie to you. Listen. <laughs> you know, Jay, it's funny that you bring that up. Literally, this was a month ago. Not even a month ago. Three weeks ago, uh, I took Amanda's car to get the oil changed. And... Um, when I pulled up, this guy comes out to talk to me, you know, at the window. You know, it's one of those you sit there, you know what I'm saying? You don't go inside. You sit there in your car and they change your oil in like 10 minutes. And this guy walks up. He's a rough-looking dude, y'all. He's bald-headed, had tattoos, you know, the tear tattoo. And then he had tattoos all down his arm. And I'm thinking, this dude finna rob me right here in the oil place. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I didn't know he worked there. You know what I'm saying? But come find out he worked there. And he came up, sir, can I help you do it? We got to talk and so forth. Well, anyway, he kind of went and started doing some stuff. And he came back a little later, and uh, we got to talking and uh, got into the conversation of family. And he said, well, I, I don't see my family anymore. And the first reaction I had was, brother, you need to get that fixed. You know, I don't care how many tattoos you got. I'm going to give you some truth. You know what I'm saying? But he looked at me, and he said, I'm, I'm only here today because I'm on work leave. I'm I'm in jail serving 22 years I said well brother what'd you do it's pretty sad that's what I always ask what'd you do like some people don't talk about that you know what I'm saying and then I'm a little scared of what they're gonna say you know like, you know I robbed a dude in an old change place you know was... <laughs> he looks at me and this is what he tells me guys 
He said, I killed a man. I said, all right. And he said, I'm going to hell for it. Who oh, open door. So I obviously, I started preaching. And the more that I got to talking to him and the more that tears started coming down his face and my face, he tells me this story. His daughter was raped. He found out the next day, he went straight over to his neighbor's house who raped him, and he killed him. And I'm sorry, y'all can be extremely upset at your pastor right now, but I'm going to tell you right now. It says, thou shalt not murder. But it also says that you will do all things out of love. And if somebody is coming after my child, I'm going to do whatever I got to do to protect my child. And I got to tell this man. I said, brother, I'm going to tell you right now. Number one, how do you feel about it since then? And he told me. He said, man, I, I do. I feel convicted. He said, I wish I'd have gone a different way. And I looked at him. I said, you, <laughs> I would have done the same. And I told him, I said, here's the thing, brother. God tells us to do all things out of love. You think about men that fight for our country, men and women that fight for our country and go overseas and they're killing other people over there. They're doing it for the love of their country and the love of their family to keep them safe. Amen. And I got to pour into this man. And I have no doubt that after our conversation, if that man stays on the walk that he's on now, I'll get to see him in heaven one day. God will forgive him. He will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. How does the church show grace to the abusive? I'm going to get through this quickly, guys. I'm sorry. There's three things that you have to do. You, you need to counsel them. You need to pray with them. You need to disciple them. And in some cases, we show grace as a church by allowing them to come to church. Notice I said in some cases. Church discipline and church protection. We'll talk about this. Guys, if we have somebody that's an alcoholic that comes to our church and they come up here at Victory Call and, and they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and they never drink again, we're going to celebrate that, right? Let's say we got a drug abuser, does the same thing, comes right down here, accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, never, never touches another joint, never you know, snorts another line, never touches another pill. We're going to celebrate that, right? If an abuser walks in here, yeah, I already saw the look on your face. I know. And he comes down here. He accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He never, he never does that again. We're going to celebrate that. But there's a way to do it. Don't think we're fixing to allow an abusive person to walk in this door and we ain't got security watching them 24-7. There's a thing called church discipline. I've studied it front and back. We will accept them and we will love them. And, and this is the conversation I'll have with them. I love you. We want you in this church. I want every dang sinner in this church. Okay? But here's the thing. We're not going to allow you to bring that sin in and keep it with you. you got to get rid of it. And we'll help you do that. We'll counsel you through the process. And that's what we'll do. We'll sit down with them and say, okay, if you want to come here, we're going to counsel you. You're going to have to show up once a week and sit down and visit with me for an hour. We're going to counsel you through this process until I feel that you're safe enough to start coming to the church. And then once you are safe enough to come to the church, I still don't trust you 100%, so we're going to have security watching you 24-7. You get up and go to the bathroom, they're going to follow you there. I'm serious. Here's what I need you to understand. Guys, God tells pastors and leadership to protect the flock that he puts in front of them. Y'all are number one. Okay? I need y'all to understand that. But there will come a time where we will have a situation like this. I need your help. I need your help. Don't come to me and say, we can't allow that person in the church. Really? Really? They're here. Amen. They're already here. Our job is to love them. Our job is to teach them the truth and to love them. And I know it's hard. I know, trust me, I've had to do it. It's hard. But that's what God calls us to do as his church. When that time comes, I'm going to ask y'all not to let me down. And I promise you, I won't let you down. But I do need you to understand this before I get off this subject. 
we will protect you. Do y'all understand me? And we will sure as heck protect your children. Do you understand me? We take that very serious at this church. Very serious. I want the abusive here, guys. I do. I want every sinner here that can get here. Every alcoholic, you know, every gambler. I mean, that's what we want. But again, they've got to change. They've got to have a heart change. And we'll watch them. I promise you that. We as a church should want to be a part of any abuser's redemption testimony. It's what we should want to be. I'm going to close with this. Doesn't get eye level. Flav's like, don't touch my piano. (sighs) If you've been abusive, I'm glad you're here. If you've been abusive, I beg you to come back. But when you come back, ask for help. You can be a Paul story. You can be a Simon story. You can be that. And the church will help you get there. If you've been abused, I love you. And I'll fight for you. This thing, abuse, has gone on way too long. And it has not been corrected by the church the way that it should be. Shame on us. Shame on us. I've never in three and a half years, now I've talked about abuse, and y'all know I have. We've talked about it, but I've never preached an entire sermon on abuse. Shame on me. And I'm going to apologize to this church for that. But please don't think I hadn't taken it serious. If this is going on in your home and in your life, it's got to stop. Please, I'm begging you, let us help. I will not condone you. I won't do that to you. And I'll keep it private. Nobody will know. We'll work it out. I've done it before. It can happen as long as you allow God to take over. So church... I'm begging you, as your pastor, as the man that God called to watch this flock, I beg you, come to me. Please let me help. I can't help you if I don't know. Quit being silent. And if you're worried about protection, we'll get you that. You hear me? We'll get you protection.